Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is the Movies We Can Learn From series, where we review movies with the idea of trying to learn from them. And the title of this episode is Why Do We Like Masters of the Air, which is playing on Apple TV uh, so much. It's a great uh, air war series. And for this discussion, we have, um, I'm not sure to say judge or captain. Uh, he's a... <laughs> Retired judge, the chief judge of the Second Circuit, Shaq Lee Federal. He's also a, a Navy Reserve captain. Welcome to the show, Shaq Lee. Hi, Jay. Glad to be here. I thought of you while I watched this. Uh, you know, it's really a fabulous, fabulous series. And I wonder if you could sort of introduce the depth and scope of the series to us so we can find out what we can learn from it. Uh, I'd be happy to. I have some notes here I can refer, refer to. Uh, Masters of the Air is, is one of the reasons I like it a lot is it's a true story. And it's based on a book written by a man named Donald Miller. Uh, I'm working my way through it right now. It's, and it's just chock full of all kinds of information and history and background. But it's, the, basically, it's about the strategic air campaign by the United States Army Air Force conducted from England against Germany during World War II. And that was conducted by what was called the, the 8th Air Force. There was a 15th Air Force, which was down in um, North Africa and later in, uh, in Italy, which attacked uh, from the south. But the 8th Air Force was um, located in, uh, in England and in East Anglia, which is in the northeast of, of, uh, northeast of London. And there were a whole bunch of bases there. And they were... Uh, uh, staffed by Americans who came from the United States. They flew over there in B-17s and also B-24s. Uh, those were the first heavy bombers, I think, maybe almost any place, but certainly in America. The heavy bombers, the first one was a B-17, and then the B-24 came along, and they, they were long-range. Uh, at the time they were developed, people thought that fighters would be obsolete because they thought bombers were so fast and they had so many guns. B-17s had 10 50 caliber machine guns on it. And uh, the, the thinkers at the time thought that if they flew close enough, that no fight, any fighter who came close would get blown out of the air. Now, that didn't work out uh, in real life. but And they go into that in, in the... Uh, in the in the series now the series is nine episodes where uh the fifth episode is on friday uh, so i've watched the first four the th number three is the Regensburg raid which i'll mention which has got some great flying in it i saw an interview uh with the people who made it uh including uh uh tom hanks and uh he he's he really uh emphasizes uh authenticity is the way he puts it and he did the Band of Brothers, and he did the Pacific. So you, if you get a scent, if you like those, you're going to like this one. And uh, anyway, uh, the 8th Air Force uh, got over to England on uh, June 8, 1942, which was pretty soon after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Just to give you some perspective, the Battle of Midway was on June 4th of 1942. So these folks were over there very early on. Now, they didn't have very many bombers at the time. That was a problem, and they weren't able to fly their first missions until uh, June of 43. 43 was the worst period because they didn't have fighter cover that could take, could escort the bombers all the way to the to their targets in, in Belgium and France and Germany. They started out bombing the, uh, excuse me, the U-boat pens along the, along the, the uh, French coast, and then they... Uh, and then they went further in. And the idea behind strategic bombing, this was developed by Billy Mitchell, the, the general in the 30s. You may remember the court-martial of Billy Mitchell. He was court-martial because he came up with this idea that battleships and, and these other uh, uh, war machines were going to be obsolete because the bombers would, would, uh, would win wars. And that was his thesis. And there were other thinkers at the time that believed in that. And... Uh, and that was the reason uh, we, you know, that 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 idea sold, and so we invested in these bombers. We didn't have very many of them at the start, and then we we built thousands of them, B twenty fours and B seventeens during the war. Once we cranked up the assembly lines, and we, you know, used good old American ingenuity. 
the idea of strategic bombing was to destroy uh, the ability of the Germans to make war. There was two views on it. One was the British view, uh, which was espoused by the, the head of the British or the RAF Bomber Command. That was Bomber Harris, a famous guy. And he believed uh, he, he, they tried flying during the daylight to bomb uh, German targets, but they, they were shredded by the German fighters and the flak. So they switched over to night bombing. And they believed they couldn't, that because they, they were in, inaccurate, they decided to bomb large metropolitan areas. And the idea was to kill the workers who worked in the factories and to destroy their, their housing so that there would be lots of refugees and, and basically terror bombing. The U.S. view was we could use strategic bombing. We could bomb specific war-making uh, industries. And the reason we could do that is because we had the Norden bomb site, which was a bomb site developed in America. And it was, it was pretty good. It was very accurate when it was tested in the clear skies over Nevada uh, in, a, in a non wartime situation. The problem with it is, as it turned out, it wasn't very useful. It, it was useful, but it wasn't as accurate as people had hoped because of the bad weather in Europe. Uh, but nevertheless, our view was it was not moral to do area bombing when we could do specific bombing of ball bearing factories and fighter plane factories and tank factories and things like that. So that was the American view of strategic bombing. And we were going to do it in the daylight so we could use the, the Norden bomb site to accurately destroy those targets. So the British would bomb at night and the Americans would bomb during the day. And this is the story of, of, those, of those bombers uh, in the 8th Air Force. Now, this particular group that's emphasized in the movie is called the Bl the Bloody 100th. It was the 100th Bombardment Group, which was one of a number of them. And uh, it was uh, located at a place called Thor Thorpe's Abbott. So its first mission, June 25th, 1943, it was referred to as the Bloody 100th. Not because it lost more than anybody else, but it, it, it had several missions that it went on where they, they had huge losses. And so it got that nickname, and uh, you know, I guess uh, airmen didn't want to be assigned to that particular group. Uh, let's see. The story kind of evolves around two personalities. One is a chap Captain John Egan, and another is Gail Cleveland, called uh, Buck, I guess is his nickname. Uh, before I go further, one other factoid, which is really interesting. The 8th Air Force during World War II, all these bombers that are bombing Germany, which I've described, they lost 26,000 young men killed. That's 30% more than the United States Marine Corps lost in all of World War II, which is a pretty amazing figure. So you, that was a, It was effective, but it was a very costly effort. And those were all, you know, young men, 18, 19, and 20, maybe 25, the oldest. Um, one person whose name comes up in, I think it's episode five, uh, who I, I want to describe is named Rosie Rosenthal, became a pilot uh, of the, the hundredth. And he's a very interesting guy. He's, you can uh, see an interview of him on YouTube. He was a young man who went to law school just from an ordinary family in New York. And he was working as a young lawyer when Pearl Harbor was bombed. And he said he went right down and he signed up in the Air Corps, became a B-17 pilot. He arrived pretty early on over there. Uh, in those days, when they first arrived, the crews had to fly 25 missions in order to be sent home. And then they would you know, do training and things like that. But the the... The survival rate for 25 missions in 1943 was very low. In fact, it was like zero. Uh, it, they were, their casualties were that bad because they didn't have that fighter cover, which I mentioned. Uh, but Rosenthal, not only did he fly 25, he flew 25 more. He re-upped, and then he flew two more after that. So he flew a total of 52 missions. Uh, from the time he went over there until the end of World War II, and at the end, he was trained to fly... B B twenty nines against Japan, and then he, he got out of the of the military. And he went back to his law firm, but he didn't feel like he had sort of uh, wrapped up his experience with the war, or done enough. 
So he volunteered as a lawyer to go to the Nuremberg uh, Tribunal that, that, you know, prosecuted all the Nazi war criminals, the main ones. And he worked as a prosecutor on the on the Nuremberg War Tribunal. <laughs> he met his wife on the boat over and they just had an interesting story about that. But he was quite a guy, and uh, he very soft-spoken, unpresupposing guy. A great interview. But anyway, that's the kind of person who was involved in this, and uh, you know we can be proud of those people. Um, okay, that's about most of what I wrote down. Oh, let's a couple other things. The uh, B-17. They thought it would outrun the fighters, but actually, it could only it only cruised at 170 miles an hour, which is pretty slow, and. Uh, in the beginning, the Spitfires would escort for a while, but they had to turn back. Then the P-47s could go a little further than P-38s. But finally, the Americans got the um, P-51 uh, Mustangs, and those planes could fly all the way to Berlin with the with the with the bombers. And initially, they used them to protect the bombers, so they would stick with the bombers and fly over them back and forth, and then. Uh, at about halfway through, uh, Jimmy Doolittle of the Doolittle Raiders, the guy who bombed uh, Tokyo, he was made the commander, and he changed the the approach. He said, "Fighters are there to destroy the Luftwaffe because they wanted to destroy the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe before D-Day, because they wanted air superiority." So he the, he he said, "Once you, once the, go ahead of the bombers and strafe the airfields." And when the fighters come up, destroy as many as you can. And when you're on your way back, do the same thing. And that that worked. Although the bomber boys kind of felt like they were bait sometimes to bring the fighters up. But but it worked. It destroyed most of the of the German Air Force. So on D-Day, there was like two fighter German fighter planes that came across the beaches, and that was it. So all of that air power actually worked, although there are people who debate whether it was effective or not, but I, I don't see how you can conclude that it was not effective. It was super costly, but that's war, you know. Any uh, questions? One thing, uh, one thing I noticed uh, was that um, <clears throat> this was the first effort <clears throat> to actually attack the Germans in Germany, mm -hmm. in Europe. It was long before D-Day. It was long before we had any any force, um, you know, in, into Europe, mm -hmm. and it was the longest running game in the war, because these guys kept on doing it for you know several years before the war was over. Um, yeah, one of the reasons Stalin Stalin was anxious for us to create a second front because he was, you know, he was losing millions of people on the Eastern Front, and we were able to demonstrate some effort. Uh, through the use of the bomber force. The other thing that uh, struck me <clears throat> is that these planes, the ones that did get back, and as you said, a lot of them never got back. And there were roughly uh, uh, 10 crew members uh, for each plane, and, that, and they lost uh, an enormous number of people because they lost an enormous number of crew members. And uh, we hear stories about how some of them parachuted out, but a lot of them didn't parachute out they went down with the aircraft and they were killed here's, uh, and that, here's a factoid on that a group like the 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 hundredth group uh bomb group had about 48 planes depending upon the situation uh during the war they lost 229 planes do the math 10 per plane <clears throat> and they would be hurt in, in all kinds of ways. I mean, I remember one scene where uh, the, uh, the the gunner uh, was in a pod that was breached by flak, and it was uh, open to the air, and they were flying at twenty five thousand feet, and it's really cold at twenty five thousand feet. And he was uh, he he continued to shoot his gun, but um, he was sitting on a piece of steel. Uh, which got cold, and when he got back, he had frostbite in his rear, in his in his uh, in his backside, because he was sitting on a piece of steel that was so cold. And there's so many ways you could be killed, so many ways you could be injured, and uh, I don't know if we've ever seen a, a movie or a series like this where you saw the way they operated within the plane 
um, you saw the way they operated in the in the uh, in the machine gun turrets. You you saw them, you know, being exposed to all that flak. Uh, I I hadn't seen anything like that. I've seen a lot of war movies. We all have, but not like that. <clears throat> um, and I thought I thought. Go ahead. Tom Hanks uh, said that uh, uh, he was asked. Um, how many B-17s did you use in the movie? <laughs> he said none. <laughs> there are very few of them left in the world now. I think there are a few that go to air shows. But they built uh, a couple of models that they said they could even taxi with. And uh, uh, and then they built one for interiors that was large. He said they had to make it larger than the actual B-17 because it's so small uh, in order to do the filming. Uh, and the, the other thing is... As you mentioned, it got very cold, and that's because those the B seventeens were not uh, were not pressurized. We 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 don't even think about that today. Can you imagine flying in a Boeing seven thirty seven at twenty five thousand or thirty thousand feet, and the windows are open? <laughs> that's basically what they were doing in the beginning. They didn't have electric electrified suits, which they got later, but apparently they were not very reliable. So frostbite was a big issue, which I, I hadn't known before. Yeah, what, what fascinated me, well, with two things. One is the, that we thought these planes either came back whole or didn't come back. But in fact, a lot of them came back in pieces. Mm -hmm. And you saw in this movie how the flak would tear away parts of the plane and they would limp back with you know all the fuselage missing and uh, all these uh, control surfaces uh, essentially destroyed, um, and somehow they would get back. And when they landed, uh, it was up to the ground crew to, to patch it back up and to make it airworthy again. But uh, some of those shots and some of those planes with the skin torn off and pieces missing, that was, that was new. Yeah, they, said exactly. you, Go ahead. they said you could take a screwdriver and punch it through the skin. Uh, but the and the uh, the B seventeens had the reputation of being the most reliable, more reliable than the B twenty fours. I'm not sure what the truth was there, but but the B seventeens apparently were uh, maybe over engineers since they were the first four engine bomber. But they took tremendous beating. There are pictures of them flying back with half the tail missing, big chunks out of the wing. It's amazing. And what struck me, and I and I begin with the notion that uh, Tom Hanks is a is a major patriot. I've seen interviews of him, and he cares deeply about this and the greatest generation. And so for Spielberg, remember Spielberg and Schindler's List and so many other movies. The two of them are great patriots, and uh, they've made other movies like this. And what I would like to review with, with you is Greyhound, which is the story of an American destroyer captain of whom, of which, was uh, Tom Hanks again. Um, and uh, um, this was a statement of the greatest generation. And these guys are trying to tell us something. They're trying to introduce us to the, great, the greatest generation. They're trying to let us see what the challenges were, the risks, and how these guys stood up in, in, the, in the face of uh, lethal fire and lethal threats. Um, and the Greyhound is another example of that. But in the case of Masters of the Sky, these guys, every time they went up, including that guy Rosenthal, uh, you know, they, they were not very likely to come back. The probabilities, the risks were way against them, and a lot of them died. And so you wondered why they did that. Why didn't they run kicking and screaming back home? Why didn't they try hard to get out of the service when they knew that it was so dangerous? And you have to, while you watch the series, you have to examine that. You have to look at what, what really motivated these guys to stay there and do it day after day after day um, and, you know, see their buddies killed. Uh, and why was that? I mean, I, it's, it, it's never answered except in, in the implication, but to me, uh, they did it because of pure, unadulterated patriotism. They were working for the free world. They were working for the country. They were working for families back home. Uh, they were, in fact, and you see them as the greatest generation. You agree, Shackley? Yeah, Rosenthal says that straight out. He just says he joined because 
it, it, what was going on was wrong and it had to be stopped. And I mean, he didn't know about the Holocaust at the time, but he, he just felt that the aggression that was going on and the destruction and the harm to humans uh, was unacceptable and he was willing to go on a state 52 missions. That's incredible. Took that risk. I mean, he's he's a dead man walking. <laughs> the, the other thing I, I'll just mention that um, Miller brings out in his book is he said they would come back from these missions and uh, they would lose maybe nine fortresses, 90, 90 people. And they, and they would go in and the, the, they had they would not have any funerals. They would just go in to their uh, the place that, that they were uh, staying and uh, other people would come in and take the gear out and the personal belongings of those who didn't return and that would be it. And then other people would come in and other planes and that's just the way there was no uh, no recognition really of of uh, the people that were lost in any formal way, which I, I didn't realize that. Oh, you compare it with an infantry experience where you lose your buddy, you're very close to your buddy, you have gone through you know, life and death with your buddy, and now you lose him, and it affects you badly. And and these guys all knew each other. They were in a social community in those in those uh, airfields, and they knew they knew all of the, the players. And when you lost a, a another bomb bomber crew, um, you felt it. And how do you handle that when you're losing, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of them every single day? You can imagine the stress and you can imagine, you know, how they they were burying their grief every day because they had to go out the next day. But I wanted to ask you some questions, though. So they went for the the uh, the the uh, U-boat pens and I, they had, had a couple of tries on that. It didn't work the first time. They they, they never mm -hmm. made that mission. Do you remember in the number one or two episodes? Um, but later they got better at it, and um, and every every day you would see the uh, commander telling them where they were supposed to go, giving them a map and a red line about this is where we're going to fly and this is how we're going to come back and these are the obstacles and uh, so forth. But there was one day, and Shackley, I, I must say that I did not understand what was going on. There was one day when he dropped the map down in front of them, and he said, uh, "Incidentally, this is different." Because you are going to fly to Africa, mm -hmm. and and you are going to you kind of uh, it was a, a diversionary maneuver, I think, um, and you, you the uh, the Nazis were going to chase you for a while, and then you're going to be out of range, and then you're going to go to Africa, which is a very long way for a flying fortress to go in those days, um, and it wasn't easy to get to Africa. Yeah, the, the, uh, the, what was going on? What was the strategy there? Well, the plan was there were three three groups, as I understand it, and uh, the first group was the hundredth, and they were going to go to Regensburg, and then they were going to go on down to Africa, and they were supposed to to draw at that point at that time. We didn't have P fifty one, so there was lots of German fighters, and the fighters would come up, and then when they'd get over the target, then there would be the the anti aircraft that they'd have to deal with, and then when they got through the anti aircraft, then the fighters could come back. Uh, but there was two other groups that were supposed to go pretty quickly, and the idea was that it would spread the 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 fighter defense thin uh, because of and and the, there would be a diversionary attack at the same time, so the Germans wouldn't know uh, which one they wouldn't be able to concentrate their effort. But what happened is this this the following two groups um, weren't able to take off on time because of weather, and so the hundreds was out there and all of the uh, German fighters concentrated on them, and so they they had huge losses. And then they turned south instead of coming back to England just as well because they had to go through all those fighters again. Uh, and they flew over the Alps and all the way to North Africa. Uh, um, I don't know how many actually made it, but uh, it's pretty dramatic in the in the episode four. It's a good episode to watch. Yeah, it was it was uh, a failed strategy in the sense that the timing was bad. They were supposed to be out of harm's way, but they weren't, and they were right in the middle of it. Yeah. Another thing that comes up is the uh, when they would they 
and Doolittle, I guess it was. No, it was Curtis LeMay who came up with this. Curtis LeMay, who later, later became chief of the Air Force. Remember that? Yeah, he, and he's the guy who, who uh, conducted the firebombing of the Japanese cities uh, with the B-29s later. Uh, but he used to go on the missions to see how it was running, and he he he, uh, he, he changed their uh, their approach. He instead of each bomber uh, using the Norden bomb site to site the target themselves, he could see that they were getting they're all over the place. So he said, "No, we're going to have a lead bomber and a lead bombardier and a lead navigator. You just follow him, and when you see the lead bomber drop their bombs, you drop your bombs, and also." Uh, he changed the procedure so that when they got close to the to the target, uh, about the time the fighters would 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 leave and the flak would start, they would the bombardier would take over the control of the airplane. Uh, I guess through the Norden bomb site, and they'd have to fly straight and level over the target to make the bombing effective, which made them super targets. And so the the flak ate them up, which were these eighty eight millimeter high velocity cannons that the Germans had, which were were pretty amazing cannons. And they were all they were I guess maybe not initially, but later on they were they were radar directed. So the radar would direct the firing of the of the of the plaque. Uh, and I guess they could move if the bombers moved a little bit, there was enough elapsed time from the time the cannon fired until the the charge got up and exploded. And uh that, so there, it was possible to do a little bit of avoidance, but not much. I never understood why they flew in these very tight formations, because if they had all these gunners and all the turrets shooting um, at the fighters, uh, wouldn't they be shooting at each other? I, you know, they've never explicitly, I don't see anything, anybody explicitly address that, but it seems like it's true because they flew in these uh, box, they call them boxes for planes. And uh, the idea was to cover each other, but those. But if you if you see how fast those fighters came through, I mean, the, the, you know, the the uh, speed fighters going three hundred miles an hour, and the bombers going one hundred and seventy miles an hour, and the, the ability to sight and hit something must have been almost impossible. But the, oh, the, oh. Other, the other thing that's interesting is that you know later on, and we talked about this, but. Uh, the Germans developed the ME-262, the first operational jet fighter, and that fighter uh, eventually was used against the bombers, and it had four 30-millimeter cannons in the nose. Can you imagine what that would do to a, uh, to a B-17? It's just incredible. Yeah. ME standing for Messerschmitt. Right. Yeah. Oh, they, they were pretty advanced in their uh, fighter engineering, for sure, and then... And yes, at the end of the war, they did have jets, didn't they? But I, that takes me to something I was going to ask you about. You know, this was all a, as you said, um, we 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 had to get our act together, and and we had to get our assembly lines working. Um, but the um, you know the technology uh, might have been over engineered in some ways, and other ways it's it was all kind of experimental. Uh, and wars tend to improve technology. We learn from the technology experiences we've had in the wars. And after the war, the U.S. had jet fighters. Um, and after the war, the U.S. developed an Air Force, uh, uh, perhaps under Curtis LeMay. Um, you know, that was second to none. We understood air power. We understood air superiority. And we learned that uh, here, in, you know, in this movie. Um, but it struck me that a lot of the, um, the gear that they were using was so different than what we had today, and it was it was an engineering learning experience. Um, the oxygen, uh, you know, the windows, the turrets, the machine guns, all of that was like less than perfected. Um, the the skin of the plane, as you you said, you could put a screwdriver through it. Uh, it was like the Model A for it, easy to repair, kept on going, but it was old technology. <laughs> And and that's what we had here. And these guys were subjected to technology that would not necessarily protect them. Um, they they didn't have the kinds of things that our military aircraft have today. Not not by far. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't have good radio communications. Uh, 
they, they didn't have systems. They didn't even have their communications between the members of the crew were not so good. Um, the control of the uh, of the aircraft was not so good. And so I, I think the, the movie brings that out, doesn't it? And you, and you get the feeling that there was there was a lot of technology that we didn't have then, uh, and now we take for granted. Well, just a few years before this uh, happened, airplanes were made out of uh, fabric, you know, and they had biplanes. I mean, that, that was only a few years before World War II started and the uh, B-17 came into existence. I mean, um, a metal-skinned aircraft was very new in the 1930s. I think the Spirit of St. Louis was uh, was metal skin, but it was one of the very first. And and so, uh, yeah, all these technologies are are uh, very new. And <laughs> now we're going on to drones. You know, that's the interesting thing is, you know, instead of s spending, what, $300 million on an F-35, uh, I, I have a feeling that that, that era is going to end pretty soon. And, uh, and we're going to be using something else, and it's probably going to be drones of one sort or another. Yeah, and, and uh, drones uh, or uh, missiles way cheaper, um, you, you know, than, than fighter planes uh, can take out an aircraft carrier. I, I've seen a number of YouTube videos on that exact point. And so we have to figure out how to, how to deal with those drones and uh, relatively inexpensive missiles. And we, we haven't quite done that yet. So it's changing under us. You know, uh, what's happening in the Middle East is teaching us so much about mm, air superiority. Um, it's different. In fact, uh, ocean superiority. Uh, you, you could have an attack on a, on a multi-trillion dollar um, you know, aircraft carrier, and, and you wouldn't necessarily be able to stop it. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we do not rule the seas in the way we used to, especially with the Chinese uh, who have developed uh, a Navy that has more ships than we do. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's that whole thing about you have to keep your eye on the ball. And mm -hmm. I really wonder, Shackley, uh, maybe not in the course of the time span covered by Masters of the Sky, but during the war, there had to be somebody back home working on new technology and improving the, what did you say, the B-17, maybe into the B-24, maybe into the B-29. Uh, we were changing the technology. We were learning from every experience to make it better. Is, well, isn't that why they had multiple models? Yeah, well, the B-29 came along very shortly after that, and it had um, remotely controlled gun turrets. Somebody could sit inside and and uh, and direct all the all the guns, all the fifty caliber guns at one time, and it was pressurized, so they didn't have to worry about the cold, and they could fly it. And a B twenty nine could fly over thirty thousand feet. Uh, it wasn't effective at that height and over Japan apparently, but uh, yeah, that and I think that it's it was actually more expensive program or second to the atomic bomb program. It was a huge program because they knew that they needed a re that the B-17s, the B-24s weren't going to do it. That that um, they would have to have the long-range uh, bombers, at least in the beginning, uh, to defeat Japan. And although uh, Curtis LeMay's idea was um, didn't need to drop the atomic atomic bombs because at the end of the air war in Europe, he would bring all those bombers from Europe over to the Pacific and use them to bomb Japan. And he, he thought he could end the war that way, but would have been less destructive? I don't know. Well, you know, I, I don't remember, but uh, I, I my, my sense of it is that the Japanese did not specialize in bombers. Um, they, had, they had fighter planes, but they didn't necessarily have bombers. Um, the, so the, we probably had an advantage over them. Yeah, the Japanese and the Germans and the Russians never uh, developed strategic bombers. The British and the Americans did, and the British built pretty good ones. The, the uh, what do they call it? I forgot the name of it, but uh, it had four Spitfire engines in it, so it was, and it carried a lot of bombs. It was, it was uh, very, very effective. So the, the whole thing here is, uh, aside from the fact that it's a statement of patriotism, the special patriotism of the greatest generation, which touched me deeply. 
uh, and I'm sure which uh, Spielberg and Tom Hanks had in mind. Um, aside from that, um, technology wins wars, and you have to be quick. You have to learn from every every technology and make it better. Um, and an air superiority, which certainly has changed from those days till now, um, is still in place, but the equipment in the air is, is different. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure how I feel about uh, the Navy and the oceans. Uh, there's probably a lot of changes in technology there too, and okay. we should explore that with, uh, you know, the Greyhound movie. But okay. all in all, what, you know, what do you take away from this? What do you take away from this series? Why was it so good for you? Oh, uh, well, I, I forget. Uh, Victor Davis Hanson, I think, says that, that an aroused, once a democracy is aroused, it's unbeatable because of the of the dynamics that's inherent in the in the in the culture and in the economic system, and I think that that World War II proved that. I mean, we were building a B twenty four bomber like every day or every hour. It was it was just amazing. Thousands of them were being built, and we were and we were training hundreds and thousands of uh, of pilots. That's one of the things that that ruined the Germans and the Japanese is they couldn't train new pilots. They didn't have the oil eventually. Uh, they just didn't have the system to do it, whereas we put it in place very fast. I mean, there wasn't even there wasn't no uh, eight Air Force, uh, you know, in 1941. They they created it, and then suddenly, you know, at the end of the war, they were they were sending out a thousand bombers to bomb Germany. And a thousand fighters to escort them. I mean, incredible. Well, I think you've touched on a very important point. It, the whole country came together to do this. It was Rosie the Riveter, and and thousands and tens of thousands just like her. Um, and it was a, a you know a national community that got behind this, and everyone was in favor of of that kind of response. You want to arouse a democracy. We are the democracy, and we are aroused. And, Eng and I also now go ahead. I was just going to say England did the same thing. I mean, even England turned out a huge number of bombers and fighters, and uh, they didn't have the numbers, the, the people that we had, but but uh, they they mobilized their entire society. It's interesting. The Germans, uh, Hitler never mobilized women into the military. There were some nurses and some auxiliaries, I guess, but he never mobilized them like Rosie the Riveter, uh, like you were saying. Uh, and I don't think the Japanese did either, uh, yeah. whereas we did, and the, and the and the British certainly did. Yeah, that was a, that was different. It was different, and you know, the levels of misogyny come to mind, cultural misogyny, if you will. The other thing is, um, you know, this movie does, of course, show you how they lived. In one of the reviews I saw in the movies, it, it made clear that slogging in the mud was not nearly as good as being a pilot, uh, a bomber pilot. You know, chances of survival were actually better in the infantry, but yeah. your quality of life wasn't so good. Yeah. These guys went to the O Club, you know, like, you know, every night. They had parties and, and they had local women uh, supporting them. And um, the base was was filled with with uh, English people who were helping right down uh, to the to children, uh, helping them and standing by and uh, caring about them right down to the dogs uh, in that in that town in that community. And so it, again, as you said, uh, the the British really supported this effort. Of course, they were as a country they were at greater risk than we were, um, so they really cared because you had those buzz bombs going into London at the same time, and so forth. Um, I'll tell you, but, uh, go ahead. I'll tell you a funny story about the re relationship between the British and the Americans during the war. My former father-in-law was a British Army officer. He was in the signals, and he landed on D-Day plus three, and then was with the British Army all the way through into Germany. And uh, uh, he said the only time he was really scared was a drunken... GI stuck a 45 pistol in his face and and wanted something from him. <laughs> well, you know, they, you know, they did cover that point uh, in one scene, I recall, 
where there was this uh, not so friendly, friendly uh, competition between the American pilots and the British pilots. Yeah. And you thought it was going to be a real slugfest, but it wasn't. Uh, yeah. Because at the, at the end of the day, they, they cared about each other and they were on the same team. But, uh, you know, we've seen and heard about that for a long time, about how there was this uh, rivalry going on. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was a small point in the movie, but it, it was something that covered. And, th and that leads me to, to say that the whole mm, interaction between the pilots and the local community and the British Air Force um, was was in there, was in the movie, was handled. And so, uh, you know, somebody who wrote this up did a lot of research. Uh, Spielberg and his friends, or Tom Hanks and his friends, they looked at every single detail. And for that, um, it made the movie special. It made the movie beyond any movie you've seen uh, about this part of the war. Do you agree? Yes, and I, I recommend the book as well. The book is, uh, is a very good read, easy read, and it has lots of great detail in it. He, he, he uh, blends this, all, this whole story together really nicely. Yeah. But the book isn't entirely true, right? Yeah, parts of it are true. Parts of it are true, but not all of it. Well, I think it's mostly true, as far as yeah. I, I can see. Yeah. A lot okay. of just the history and the background, the kind of stuff I was talking about earlier. I got all that from the book mostly. And I uh, think you think you're right. The book was largely true. The movie took liberties. Yes. Yeah, but which is just movie making, you know. You mentioned before we began the show that there was an issue about the coloration, uh, the color correction in the movie. What was your thought about that? It seems too colored, I guess, is the way I put it. The, the colors seem too, um, I don't know, uh, too dense, I guess, would be the way I put it. Like, the color, looking at you right now, the color is perfect. But if you look at that movie, the coloration is different than what you see right now. And, and I you don't, don't think it was intentional. Well, I think it was intentional. I think it it has it creates a kind of mood, um, but it's definitely not like a video, you know, where it's really sharp. And uh, I and I thought, well, maybe it has to do with the fact that they use a lot of CGI for the flying scenes or something. I don't know. But the, you're but, you right. Know. You're right. It's worth saying. It's this is like this uh, reminds me of the movie Golda, and the movie Golda they had all these. Uh, you know, battle scenes, but the movie didn't create the battle scenes. They mm -hmm. got them out of an archive. Um, and the same thing here. I, I think uh, CGI or maybe an archive or even animation um, helped them tell the story. And as you say, they had mock-ups of the planes um, and it wasn't actually taken in the air. Well, if you, um, look, at, if you look at the Pacific or Band of Brothers, uh, it, it's a different coloration. Mm -hmm. So all in all, um, you know, wrapping around everything that you've seen, I don't think I've seen as many episodes as you have. Um, what what rating would you give this? Is it against your own knowledge of the subject, your own experience in the service? Uh, and uh, ultimately, um, you know, um, your historical impressions and movie making. Well, what would I you give this on a scale of one to ten? I give it. I give it a ten. I, I. I don't think you could do it much better. Um, you know, my thing about the color is just kind of nitpicking. Uh, the the story itself, I think, is is real, and um, they've done a great job of creating the mood and and picking up. You know what it was, what it must have been like to do that. Um, and that's important. I think if you like this. It would be worth uh, watching 12 O'Clock High with Gregory Peck, which is a <laughs> version of this, <laughs> which used real B-17s <laughs> because it was <laughs> long ago. <laughs> and Jimmy Stewart. Uh, wasn't Jimmy Stewart in the Air Force? I think he was. He was a general he, in the Air Force. Yeah, he, he flew 25 missions in B-24s in World War II. Yeah, wow. Well. <laughs> <laughs> and he made movies about it later, and that was before <laughs> Real Planes also. And I'll tell you my reaction, and, and I'll tell you why. I, I would also give it a 10 or better, but why? It's, it's purely political for me. Uh, what I mean is, um, you know, we talk about how the uh, youngest generation, uh, generation 
that, that are now coming to voting age and so forth, and will control the ballot box in the years to come, uh, that they don't know about civics, and um, perhaps um, more importantly, they don't know about American history. Mm -hmm. It isn't taught, and uh, they haven't read the books we talk about. They haven't seen the movies we talk about. They haven't ideated over the guys who were in the uh, the greatest generation who were there flying uh, in the masters of the sky or the Navy or the infantry. They weren't there. They don't understand. They don't understand that the government is an extension of us. We are the government. We are the military. And the military and the government is us. It's all together. And I think the average education around the country doesn't allow for that. It doesn't, it doesn't um, investigate that. So anybody who makes a movie like this, especially a very watchable, uh, thrilling, dramatic movie, and also factual, um, you know, is doing a great service to the country and that generation by making people aware of, um, of what it was like then. And, and, and I felt uh, a sense of patriotism throughout the whole movie. That's what, I, that's what I loved about it. And I want everyone to know. Absolutely, I totally agree. Yeah, um, it's 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 an excellent movie, and and it just brings brings back to you how horrible war is. I mean, the, the millions of people. How many people died in World War Two? Fifty million, sixty million. Incredible. And and the thing is, it reminds me that you there has to be deterrence, or this sort of thing just gets repeated, and it's been repeated and other places in the world a number of times since this time. And we don't seem to, perhaps by seeing movies like this, we will remember that and we'll think about it. Yeah, but the flip side, just to touch on it, is that um, these guys, among other motivations, were motivated, motivated by the atrocities. They didn't know about the camps, I agree. But they knew the Nazis were doing atrocities. Yeah. And they knew there was a good side and a bad side to this war, and they were on the good side. Um, and and that, that, that motivated them um, to deal with the problem. And so the other side of it, and then we could spend another show doing an examination of this, is that uh, although war is terrible, sometimes it's necessary. And every one of those guys in those airplanes were committed because they felt it was necessary to achieve the right goal. And it's hard to deal with, especially now, uh, with what's going on in the Middle East. But I think you could make a case for the fact that when somebody, a nation state, goes rogue, there may be no other way to stop. Yeah, well, I feel the same way about Russia attacking Ukraine. I mean, what's the difference between that and Hitler going into the Sudetenland and Czechoslovakia and uh, that that history? Amen. I totally agree. Well, thank you, Shackley. Um, Captain Judge Shackley Raffetto <laughs> joining us for a discussion of this great series uh, on Netflix. Thank you so much, Shackley. Take care, Jay. I'll talk Take to you care. soon. Bye. Aloha.